So hello everybody. Um, so I hope you're uh, in good health and in relatively good spirit. Um, so let us, we have not met for about 10 days. So let me remind you what we have covered last time. Um, we said that most of hadrons are strongly decaying resonances and in particular, Almost all exotic hadrons like pentaquarks, tetraquarks are strongly decaying resonances. So for example, they are observed as peaks in the cross section in experiment. And that's a way we need to observe them also on the lattice. So we need to study the scattering, like this one scattering of a proton and J psi, you would have to do to find pentaquark peaks, for example, but you'd have to do more, actually. Okay, so basi uh, the basic thing of these lectures is that to study those resonances and similar states, one has to do a scattering on the lattice. And we uh, mainly consider S-wave, and we denoted P as a momentum of particle in center of no mass frame, and this was one of the most important formula that the scattering amplitude T is given in terms of the phase shift in this way. And then we went from the real energies, which are observed in experiment and which are observed also on the lattice, to complex energies, where energy in this case uh, denotes actually center of momentum energy. And we defined two Riemann sheets. Uh, the Riemann sheet one was where momentum, imaginary part of the momentum was positive, and the Riemann sheet two was where the imaginary part of the momentum was negative. That was just the definition. Because from a given energy, you get the momentum by the square root, so you have two choices. And then we've, we discussed um, the locations of poles of the scattering amplitude in the complex energy plane. And this is actually what helps us to identify states. We talked about three different states, bound state, virtual bound state, and a resonance. So if you look at this complex energy plane, and let me denote that green denotes Riemann sheet one, and red denotes Riemann sheet two, we said that a bound state corresponds to a pole of a scattering matrix below threshold in sheet one. Okay. Um, virtual bound state pole corresponds to a pole on the real x on the real axis also below threshold but on Riemann sheet two. That's not really a normalizable state we said but the bound state is something which you're familiar with like a hydrogen deuterium. And then a resonance is a pole away from real axis on Riemann sheet 2. And these poles affect the physical scattering, which is indicated by this green line, um, on the real, um, which is on the real axis slightly above it on Riemann sheet 1. That's where experiment probes. So if these poles will be close to this physical axis, then there will be some bumps in the, in the cross section related to these states. That was basically the lecture of the last time. Now there was one question um, remaining and let me just briefly go into that. But for those who were not there, you will not understand. So this is just a passing remark. Um, the question was on which Riemann sheet the resonance lies. Okay. We used the relativistic Bright-Wigner parameterization of the resonance. And if you remember, we, we said that this is how um, this product looks for a bright Wigner resonance, for a relativistic bright Wigner resonance, okay? Now, um, 
perhaps well and from this we derived that the resonance happens at this momenta p so it has negative imaginary momenta so it's on sheet two i just want to say that actually the derivation was correct uh, because actually um, we are dealing with the relativistic bright Wigner where energy is related to the momentum like this. I don't want to go to this detail again, but if you're kind of wondering, go back and you'll see. Okay, so for S wave, we correctly derive that the resonance is on Riemann sheet two. Now for a general partial wave, we actually didn't derive it. And it would take me half an hour, which I do not have to do this derivation. So actually I appended some material. You'd have to go through six pages, which are very clearly written in this book. Okay, it's a non-relativistic derivation, but this derivation tells you that, um, that a resonance occurs on Riemann sheet two for any partial wave. We showed it on for partial wave L equal to zero, but for any partial wave it occurs on this. You have to believe me for now, but if you don't, you go to these six pages and actually you just basically need to really read this one paragraph to really understand. But I don't have, maybe at the end of the fourth lecture I have time, but I don't know whether I have time. Okay. So um, that was what we were doing last time. Now, before we go to Lattice, let me spend five more minutes in the continuum. Why? Um, what we talked about was mo mostly partial wave L equal to zero. Now, um, let me mention what happens for higher partial waves in non-relativistic quantum mechanics where the, the things are the simplest. For higher partial wave, basically one has to solve this equation, right? You have a potential, and if you want to solve what is the solution in the region of potential, then you have to solve this equation. Actually, this is not difficult at all. If you have Mathematica, I'm just giving you how to do that. You need to solve this equation. You just basically write the equation, and use two boundary conditions on this unknown function u and use n dissolve and Mathematica will spit you the result, spit out the result. So this is easy, okay? So for arbitrary potential, then you get a solution inside uh, the range of the potential. What about outside the range of a potential? When then there is no potential, this is zero and then you know the solutions, these are vessels. These are the spherical vessels. There is an outgoing wave and ingoing wave and linear combination. And actually by definition, the coefficient in, uh, in front of the outgoing wave is this, which is expressed in terms of this phase shift. Okay. And um, for large R, you know that this will behave like this. The solution is just shifted with this partial, uh, with this phase shift. Okay, so you have a, if you have a solution inside and now you have a solution outside by gluing them in between, you get the phase shift. Okay, and when you have a phase shift as a function of energy, then you have a scattering matrix like this, like before, and then you have the sc uh, scattering amplitude T, which is the major object of this course. It's, Again, the very similar equation as last time. Scattering amplitude is given by this expression which we'll use all over again. Um, is there some question here? Ah, sorry, I didn't say, I'm not following the chat. So if you have questions, just pick up. If it becomes too chaotic, then I will, uh, I will stop it and then I will have questions in the breaks or something. Okay. Another, th another important comment, um, often one is interested in the scattering near threshold. 
And very often lattice cannot do much more than near threshold because it becomes very difficult to go far away from threshold. Okay, so what you do near threshold, you do expansion in momentum of particle. At threshold, the uh, momentum is zero, and then you ex Taylor expand. And turns out, which I'll briefly ar uh, argue why, turns out that then the phase shift is proportional to P to the power of two L plus one. So briefly, let me give you an argument, how you get this, which is given in Landau. And instead of P, it's done in terms of K here. This is the general solution outside the region of potential, okay, from Landau. And then for large R, this can be rewritten in this form, okay? You have sinus and cosine. Now, if you rewrite this in terms of phase shift, that's the expression I gave you before for large R. It's just shifted by the phase shift. And now you use the additional addition theorems and you can rewrite this as this sine and cosine and some prefactors. So by comparing this and this, you see that this, this coefficient over this coefficient has to be this over this. And by simply putting those together, you can see the tangent of, of the phase shift should be proportional to k to l plus one for small k, okay? I, I was going quickly, I just gave you a brief idea. Okay, so if p cotangent delta is proportional to these plus corrections, then you know that p to the power l plus one times cotangent delta will be constant near threshold, but then it will have small corrections. So, equal tangent delta will be constant plus some corrections p of p squared or p to the fourth. And that's what's called effective range expansion. It's very often used in lattice calculations. Um, so for S wave, this is p times cotangent delta is some constant, which is here called scattering length, plus the next uh, correction is, you call this coefficient one over R naught typically. So this is used. Okay, so for an exercise, if you like to do it, you can do this scattering um, in spherical well potential, which we had, and there we derive the exact formula for the phase shift in terms of the momentum. You have the exact formula. And of course, it depends on the product of the potential and the mass, which I call C here. So there you can actually put it into the mathematica, this expression, P times cotangent delta, and you make Taylor expansion in momenta. And you'll see that actually you really get some constant plus some constant times P squared and so on and so forth. So this is, could be taken as an exercise if you like. Okay, so I think this concludes our um, discussion in continuum. Do you have some questions on this? No? Okay. Now, lecture two, we jump to the lattice, finite volume, that's the title. So we, so the outline will go, we'll study lattice QCD. First, we briefly discuss the effect of a, a reduction of rotational symmetry for this cubic box. Then we'll discuss the relation of correlation matrices to Eigen energies and overlaps, this you've seen already. Then we'll tell you how to extract these eigen energies of overlaps via the GVP variational principle, and I'll give you a proof of that. You know probably the, the idea how to do it, but you haven't seen the proof, maybe, or you have. Okay. Then briefly we'll discuss the strongly stable hadrons which are kind of easy, but the main part, it will be this one. Then we'll study the scattering and we'll say, what is the relation between eigenenergies and the scattering amplitude? 
And that hopefully will be the main part of today's lecture. This derivation is a little bit um, painful. This is the derivation of Lusher equation between the eigen energies and the scattering amplitude. But I'll give you the main ideas which helps you to understand what is going on. Okay, non-perturbative uh, lattice QCD, you know, you have a QCD Lagrangian and you evaluate Feynman path integrals in discretized Euclidean space-time. Right, you're doing PhD in lattice QCD, so I don't have to explain much more on that. Okay, since this is a lecture on finite volume Q, uh, lattice QCD, let's have a system at rest and let's consider what's uh, the effect of this finite volume. Well, if um, we are in the continuum, um, rota all rotations are symmetry transformations and there is infinitely many of them. You can rotate by three degrees and it's a symmetry transformation. For a cubic lattice, um, there is only 24 symmetry transformations. You can rotate by 90 degrees, you cannot rotate by three degrees. It's not a symmetry anymore. So there is only 24 elements. Okay, now what about irreducible representations? Just let me remind you what that is. Irreducible representation is a representation of transformation where objects transform just between themselves and this transformation representation cannot be reduced any further. Okay, so in the continuum, the irreducible representations are denoted by spin j. And then these representations are, uh, are 2j plus 1 dimensional, okay? So spin is a good quantum number. On the cubic lattice, um, we said there is only 24 elements, okay? So um, the irreducible representations now correspond to these crystallographic chemistry representations, kind of, you'll find them in chemistry um, pages on web. Uh, and they are denoted as follows. So now spin is not good quantum number anymore, this irreducible representation, like for, so for example, T1 is a good quantum number. Some question? Yes, maybe I have a question. Yes. Do you have a specific reference for this uh, derivation of this uh, irreducible representations and uh, all these 24 elements? I can have a look up. Oh, <laughs> um, I can give you a reference, um, send me an email, <laughs> and then I, I'll think of a good reference. I mean, this is. Oh, this is ages, ages old. This is not even on archives. It's much before the archive, right? Um, I see, okay, thanks. Um, uh, the one, I mean, this is not even related to lattice QCD. You'd have to look into the chemistry books because, you know, in chemistry, you have these cubic uh, symmetries. I mean, let me just say, these letters, if they are not familiar to you, they are not important. It's just um, T1 is a representation of these rotations that cannot be reduced further. And it has, it is three-dimensional. For example, here 2J plus, uh, this is 2J plus one-dimensional, this is three-dimensional. And if you're interested, these are the characters um, of related to these elements over these ereps. Well, I'm, this is not something which I need for further on lectures, okay? You just need to know basically for further on lectures that we don't have all the rotational group, but only certain number of elements. And please write me an email to remind me, I'll give you some material. 
Okay, now let's have an object with indexes Jm which transform under rotations according to spin j and projection m. An object is, for example, an interpolator. And it will transform like this. OK? So um, in continuum, in continuum, for example, objects with spin 2 that will transform under rotations between themselves are these five. Okay, with various projections. This is irreducible in continuum. But this is not irreducible under the reduced symmetry group on the lattice. It turns out that this can be block diagonalized. You put two blocks and they are irreducible separately. So it turns out that this one can be reduced to uh, sum of two representations, two block diagonal elements. Okay? So you see that spin two objects will appear in this representation and in this representation, and so on and so forth. And if you return, uh, uh, turn this table around, I write here reducible, irreducible representation on the lattice. For example, you can see spin 2 will happen in T2, and it will happen in E. That's good. And besides, you can see that if you simulate in this irreducible representation, for example, T1, which is a good quantum number on the lattice, then you'll get contributions from spin 1 and spin 3. Okay, for those who have never heard about these things before, this may be a little bit yeah, this may be too quick. Um, let me tell you that this will not be particularly relevant for, for this lecture further on for next lecture. Okay, so just to <laughs> make you feel better. I was assuming that you've seen some of this a little bit, but if you haven't done, it will not be needed so much. Okay, but those things that I present now will be more needed. Okay. So if you want to study some system, use an interpolator which creates a system with given quantum numbers. A good quantum number on the lattice is a given a reducible representation. But in the continuum, you can think it as of JPC quantum number. Okay? And use, you'll use some operators which create a system. We'll talk much more about interpolators in next and the last lecture. But here, this is a brief idea, which is enough for, for, for now. For a meson system, you can do this kind of interpolator. But if you want to study two meson system, to study the scattering, we'll produce such an interpolator. One meson pro uh, projected to momentum one, and another meson projected to momentum two. And then you might also use some dyquark, anti-dyquark interpolating fields. So, for example, if you want to study charmonium, you can use ch charm anti charm, and then this meson meson will be d anti d meson interpolators, and you can use diquark anti diquark. Okay. And with these interpolators, you compute the correlation matrix. Okay. You compute the correlation matrix between every operator which creates a state and every operator which annihilates it and you have n operators, for example, and you compute a correlation matrix. Now, if you insert a complete set of eigenstates in here, what you'll get, you, you'll see that this correlation matrix um, depends on time in this way. So here I'm assuming you've seen this derivation. At least three quarters of you probably have seen this derivation. It's, but for those who have not, there is a derivation on the next page. But, but please tell me if, if you'd like me to derive it. If you're working on the lattice, you probably have seen it. OK. So the correlation matrix 
has the following time dependence, where E and are the eigenenergies of eigenstates. And what is this? This is the overlap. This is the overlap of eigenstate N to operator that you used I. We'll call it overlap. Um, so, yeah. So, for example, if you study Charmonium system with uh, vector quantum numbers, you'll get eigenstates, discrete eigenstates. And the ground eigenstate will be j psi. And the ground state energy, if you consider momentum zero, will give you just the mass of j psi. This is very simple. If you have the correct quark masses, then you're done. But the higher eigen energies will give you the energies of two hadron states, like dd bar. This will be discrete eigen energies. And then today we will tell you, I'll try to tell you that when you have those eigen energies, how you rigorously derive the scattering amplitude from those energies. Okay, but the one quantity you really extract on the lattice are these eigen energies. The rest is actually this is the only quantity needed to get the scattering amplitude. Um, is there some question here? Okay. Okay, so maybe just to make it a little bit more diverse, I'm going to go to the tablet now so that my people, people are not falling asleep. Hopefully. Okay. And I have to stop share this and I share now, um, I'm sharing now um, my iPad. Okay. Now, parts of this you've probably seen, but I'm not sure whether you've seen um, some proofs. Okay, suppose you have interpolators of large N interpolators. So you, you compute um, the correlation matrix, which is N by N matrix, time dependence from lattice. Well, this takes two, uh, the most of the time, of course. But once you have them, how do you extract the eigen energies and overlaps? That's the question. Okay, this is now by this is completely commonly done now by this G uh, variational procedure. It's called GVP. So let let me give it to you. You take this matrix and you find um, the eigen functions and eigen vectors. from this equation. So this is um, n by n matrix. This is eigenvalue, which is just a number. And you'll get, of course, how many eigenvalues you'll get. Eigen, from this problem, you'll get n eigenvalues, okay? And let's denote different eigenvalues by n. And eigenvectors also by n. So, this is the eigenvectors, and this is some low reference time T naught, like three, four, or something. Okay. And the claim is that basically how to extract the energies, the claim is that I want to derive for you is that the, this, the nth eigenvalue will be just exponentially falling with the eigen energy E and T, plus some correction. Okay, that's what I want to show. Okay, let me maybe take five minutes. So, uh, we'll assume that between time T naught and T, only N eigenstate contribute. You have to take such large T naught that 
only n eigenstates will contribute. In practice, you would never reach such T naught, but okay, for the derivation, let's assume only n eigenvalues, eigenstates contribute. Then this Cij T is nothing but um, um, where n goes from one to n, not to infinity anymore, okay? Now let's define a vector. Let's define a vector u such that it will satisfy this. So we want to define a vector which you can always do, um, that it will satisfy this. Now I claim that with this eigenvector, I can construct an operator which will only create nth eigenstate. So I claim that this operator, which I call operator O n tilde, which is constructed from operators OI that you employed in your simulation and you sum over one to N, I'm claiming that this operator creates only eigenstate N, small n. Let me uh, show that this is the case. I want to show now that basically, um, if you create, if you, sorry, if you employ this operator, which I defined on the vacuum, you'll get only state n and no other state. So for arbitrary state, this should be only non-zero when m is equal to n. Let me, let us compute what is this now, okay? So I, I put this. Let me insert this operator in here. And let's see what we will get. I'll get M and then this sum I put out. And then I get this operator here and this U I, I put out again. Okay. And this is by definition nothing but Z I M star, okay? Okay, so this is this z. But note that z times u, um, when you sum over, you get this. So this is nothing but delta nm. So this operator, which I wrote here, creates an eigenstate n, and it cannot create any other eigenstate. So, so far some question? No, okay. So we are getting close. We have an operator that under this, this let's say approximation creates only eigenstate n. Now I just want to show that, um, how lambda then behaves. I want to show that lambda behaves like this. So let's uh, pull out uh, lambda from, yeah, I don't have a pointer in this program, sorry. Let's extract lambda from here. So lambda is by this definition is nothing but ct or nu and t over c t naught u n t. But now it's easy actually to derive what is the denominator and numerator. It's, it takes another minute and then we are done. Okay. So let's, let's see the numerator. No, the num uh, numerator, so yeah. Numerator is this. I put now the indices back. 
C is a matrix and and u is a vector and i sum over all j from 1 to n. Okay, we insert correlation matrix. Now we'll insert this correlation matrix, which is written here. Okay, j equal to 1 to n, and then we insert this correlation matrix. And then I, uh, um, sorry, I better put another, uh, so I need to put another um, index for the correlation matrix. I put N prime. Okay. And then it's U J N of T. Okay. Now let's see what we have. I'm a little bit, um, yeah, let's see. We want to use this formula up here again. So we see that this and this summed over J will be nothing but, um, will be nothing but um, delta N, N prime. Okay, so this n prime will be n, and the only thing that remains is then this guy and this guy. So let's write what we get. Z i, now n prime becomes n, and this is E n t. Okay, some question here? No? And then we are basically done. With the lambda n is then obtained from this ratio. Let's write it. On top, we put this expression here, evaluated at t. So it's z i n e to the minus i n t. On the bottom, we evaluate it at time t zero. Okay, t zero. So you see that in principle, under the above assumption, that's how the eigenenergy will be behaving in time. So it's proportional to e to minus e n t. So if you extract this eigenvalue at large times, you are able to extract eigen energy N. Is there some questions in that? Okay, uh, yeah, I failed to give a reference. Lucier Wolf would be the reference. I'm not sure whether I gave it. Although it's not easy to get this paper on the web because it's so old. <laughs> Lucier Wolf. Yeah. Okay, so no questions on that. So I think I can go back to the uh, can I ask something quick? Sure. I might remember this wrong, but the exponential, uh, like this e to the minus energy time, uh, times the time, um, you said you don't want to drive it because we've all seen it and that's the case in, for me, but isn't that only true for large volumes or are we still assuming we have an infinite or very large volume? Or? No, no, this is for finite volume, you'll have, okay. you'll have a discrete, set of eigen energies n, right? So the um, correlation function will look on the finite volume like this. Um, it will be a discrete sum over all eigen energies. In infinite volume, it will be more complicated because the, these eigen energies can be arbitrary. I mean, they're continuous above threshold. And we'll talk about this today. And then it's, when you sum the over continuum energies, it's perhaps not an exponential anymore. Okay? Oh, okay, in, okay, thank you. Ah, you mean, ah, you're talking about finite time effects. 
on, for finite, of course, there will be some finite time effects due to the boundary condition in time, which I did not consider. Maybe that's what you were referring to. Yes, yes, yes. That's probably, I wasn't yeah, remembering. Yeah. Okay, uh, yeah, that yes. I did not uh, consider. Um, yeah. Yeah, but maybe if there is questions, I can answer in the break. Otherwise, I'll not be able to cover material. Yeah, this is, suppose you are far away from the boundary in time or the mid of the lattice. Suppose this is your lattice time on, this is your t is equal to zero, this is t equal to nt, and this is your midpoint, and then you are far away from the midpoint that there is no effect from time. Okay, that's from finite time. Okay, now let's go to back to the slides. Drink something. Okay. I'm also, so I tell you that from eigen energies, you can extract the eigen, no, so from eigen values, you can extract eigen energies. Actually, there is also a relation which from eigen vectors and, uh, and eigen energies and correlators, you can extract also these overlaps, but I will not prove that to you. We'll have to look into some other material. Uh, so, if you have correlations, functions, eigenvectors, and eigenenergies, you can always extract also these overlaps. So, this is what you get directly from lattice. And then it's, then it's, um, yeah. Okay. Now we have eigenenergies. And this, if this is significantly below threshold, then threshold is unimportant. Then if you have a system at zero momentum, this eigen energy will give you a mass of a hadron. And then you do the extrapolations to continuum, to infinite volume, and masses you have to extrapolate to physical masses. In principle, that's simple, right? In practice, it may be tedious, but then you get masses of, single, of stable hadrons like proton, right? PMW collaboration did all these extrapolations in all glory and uh, got the mass of a neutron and a proton, which agrees with experiment, which I think is very fascinating. And not only that, also the mass of a neutron minus the mass of a proton gets 1.4 MeV in agreement with experiment. But here, of course, not only QCD, but QED had to be incorporated. Um, okay, there is certain other hadrons that are stable and they don't fill the threshold. And this can be done with these methods. Some of those hadrons are actually approximately stable, like eta b. In principle, it can even decay strongly, but this is neglected here. So here you have uh, the masses of, um, of um, stable hadrons from high precision QCD calculation and they agree with the experiment. So I would consider this as a solved problem, masses of stable hadrons. Okay, but you know that the uh, topic of this course is not stable hadrons, but hadrons that can decay strongly or are almost can decay strongly, are near threshold. So for that, you have to study the two hadron system and the scattering. So basically you have to put two hadrons on the box, each one with a given momentum. And I'll always consider in these lectures that there is periodic boundary conditions in space. So let's go to this business. Um, so what is the eigenenergies of two hadrons in a finite box if there is no interaction first between them? Okay. So if there is no interaction, the lowest eigenenergy will be just the sum of their masses. Uh, let me point that uh, out that I'll consider on, in these lectures only the system at rest with total momentum zero. So then they can be all at rest. Then they can have uh, back-to-back -back momentum two pi over L. Or 
they can have arbitrary uh, momentum, which is multiple two pi over L due to the periodic boundary conditions. Okay. So for example, for this guy, what is the eigenenergy? If they don't interact, it will be just the sum of individual relativistic energies. The one point to note is that, of course, that the spectrum is discrete, not the continuous. Well, in experiment, the volume in experiment is the whole universe, so it's L goes to infinity. And since L goes to infinity, P, uh, moment, relative momenta is arbitrary, so you can reach any energy above threshold. The energies are continuous. Yes. Okay. So I guess the reminder of this lecture uh, will be the relation between uh, finite volume energy and the scattering amplitude of this energy. This is called Lucia relation. First, I will tell you, I'll give you this Lucia relation, and then we'll try to show the few main points in, in the derivation of these Lucia equations. Uh, since now it's, we are kind of um, half through, I would uh, make a break of five minutes now, just to relax a little bit. But before that, I would ask if there is some questions. Um, excuse me, can you go back to the previous slide, uh, please? Sure. Okay, so uh, these equations are uh, written in the center of mass uh, reference frame, right? Yes. Okay, okay. So uh, this guy has momentum P, this has momentum minus P, right? Okay. So I, I could have written here minus P squared, but it's the same. Since yes, yes, sorry, sorry. Uh, no, it's fine. Just a confirmation, uh, sorry. Yeah, true. Um, yeah, for simplicity, we will stay in the rest frame. But all, most of, actually, I should tell you most of, these calculations that extract the scattering amplitude, they use the rest frame, but also the systems where the total momentum is non-zero. But this becomes a bit technical and maybe it's not so appropriate for school. So I'm doing it in the rest frame. More questions? No? Uh, there was a question which I maybe said I would answer in the break. Yeah, about this, um, maybe to, okay, I, I propose we make a five minute break. We meet in five minutes, but if there is some immediate question on this um, irreducible representations for those, I can stay online for a, another minute. <laughs> yeah, so five minute break. Okay, right. So let's meet again at uh, five, uh, five minutes to three. Yeah.
I mean, um, if, if um, the person who was asking about these discrete irreducible representations, you never had have met this. This, yeah, this was probably not enough of explanation, but just, I mean, it's. Sorry, uh, I had this question because uh, many authors try tend to skip uh, to discuss the details of. Yeah, 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 yeah. Sure, 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 sure. Yeah, it's true. And the the yeah. So I mean, the one the one comment before I go on, I can make is like, for example, if you have elements x, y, z, and the rotations, you know that they will. Um, they will um, get rotated between themselves only, right? And, and you cannot further block diagonalize it. Whatever, for all these rotations that relate to a cube, they will always mix. You cannot further reduce. So this will correspond, these three elements will correspond to a representation T1, we call it irreducible representation, T1, right? And then, for example, if you have these kind of objects and you make rotations, you make arbitrary rotation among 24, you'll see that always they rotate between themselves. They never, you'll never get X, you'll get, never get something different than these two objects correspond to two-dimensional representation, uh, which is irreducible, and you'll call this irreducible representation E2, okay? So, um, so this representation uh, correspond to, to, to operations on certain elements, and you can write them in the matrix form. And these matrix forms, I think they are written, yeah, they are surely written in, in many references. One is Rusetsky et al., which I don't recall, please send me an email. Um, and then, so these are matrices, and you know how they will act on objects. Like this will be two by two matrix. And what these numbers in here tell you, what is the uh, trace of this matrix, it's a character. So this is a character of this matrix which represents this. And this character is two for identity and, and minus one for this. I mean, this character of course, uh, this matrix depends on which operation you do, depends on which of these transformations you're doing, okay? Okay, maybe I, 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 I need to go forward now, but, um, Yes, yes, I understand. Yeah, but this is uh, not so essential for what we will discuss. It's just because my title is finite volume, I wanted to mention this effect. Okay. Okay, so, so just a, a reminder before we go on. If we ha we'll always now have two hadrons, which kind of are in a box, finite box, for the reminder of this lecture. And if they don't interact, the energies are simple. N is multiple of two pi over L, and the corresponding energy is this one. But the important point is they will be discrete. Okay. Now, we are in, now, of course, hadrons interact, and we want to um, extract the informa rigorous information about this interaction. And this is, if you scatter two hadrons, you get rigorous information about the interaction. Okay, so first let me give you a glimpse what is the recipe which Lucher gave us. He says, okay, you extract the eigenenergies from the lattice. Now, if you have operators and you do this variational principle, you are able to extract the eigenenergies. And you have to extract them accurately. That's a technical problem. Then Lucher gave us a relation, which I'll show, of course, that for each eigenenergy, you can determine the phase shift at that energy or a scattering matrix at that energy. 
okay? So for example, from this energy, you say, oh, my phase shift through the, obtained from a Lucian relation is this one. From this energy, you get at this energy, you get this phase shift and so on and so forth. So if you're lucky or if you work hard and things go well, in the end of quite a difficult procedure, you'll get phase shift dependence on energy for certain discrete eigenenergies. And then, since you know the relation between phase shift and scattering amplitude, you'll have the scattering amplitude as a function of energy, and that's the aim. And then from that, of course, you can determine whether you have a bound state, a resonance, virtual bound state, as we said the last time. Now, for the reminder of this lecture, the relation, this relation is the main object. So what is the relation between the discrete eigenenergies in finite volume to the scattering matrix in infinite volume? Okay. Um, let me first do uh, the one-dimensional example, which is really simple, and I, I'll really do it. The, the, Q, and this is in quantum mechanics. And then I'll go to QFT. So suppose this is one dimensional box of size L. And if there is no interaction, if there is no potential, this will be a wave function. And due to the periodic boundary condition, the momentum is multiple two pi over L. So this we know already. What about if there is an interaction here? in this region, but not outside the region. So if there is interaction, the wave function will be having a phase shift outside the region of interaction that we also know now, okay? It will have a phase shift, but in order to catch this boundary condition, periodic boundary condition, the momentum here outside the region of potential will have to change in order to catch this boundary condition. So you can already see from there that there will be a relation between the phase shift, the size of the box, and the momentum, right? And the momentum is related to the energy in this way anyway, outside the region of potential. So from this, you can see that there will be a relation between phase shifts, volume and momentum or energy. Now let us do it. I'll try to do it on a tablet again, just to, as I said, to make things a little bit diverse. Um, so let me turn on the tablet. Um, can you see my tablet? No. Not yet. Yes? No? No. At least no, no. no, no. I stop share. Um, let me uh, open it first. Share. Yeah, okay. Yeah, okay, now you can okay. see it. Um, we want to get out of these messy things. Now we can actually delete this one. Oops. Let's go to this um, Lucier thing. Okay. Okay. Now, so let's see. Um, in the region out of the potential, so for X bigger than R, R is the region of potential, uh, the, the wave function will be plane wave still. It will, it will be like this, cosine, um, P X, absolute X plus some phase shift. Okay. Um, yeah. So this um, wave function already respects that the wave function at L half is equal to the wave function at minus L half because I put the absolute value here for X. Now, we want also to make the derivative continuous from one to the other boundary. So this will render, let's say, the Lucia equation for this case. 
So we want the derivative to be uh, continuous. So I want to make psi over this should be equal to derivative there. So let's make those derivatives. If I, since I need a little bit space, I, I write here. So I, I make a derivative of psi. It's a cosine and then um, p x evaluated at l, l half and then another p comes outside. Okay, this is this was this one. Now it has to be the derivative on the other side. So let's make a derivative on the other side. It will, sorry, and the derivative of cosine is sinus. Sorry, minus sinus. Okay, so the derivative of cosine is sinus. Now p and uh, I insert here um, the other end. So I'm making now this guy plus delta. And uh, since I'm, I, uh, now I have to make derivative with respect to the argument over x, and the argument there is of course minus px plus delta, because if we are at negative x, then I'll get minus p. Okay. So in order for the left hand side to be uh, equal to the right hand side, the only way, because they differ only by the sign, is that both are zero. Okay. So basically, you see that left hand side has to be zero and the right hand side has to be zero. And that's also apparent on the picture. No more um, so you see, this derivative is equal uh, to this derivative. The only way to do it is basically to make them both zero. Okay, so this means that sine p l half plus delta should be zero, and this is achieved at the momenta where this is equal to n pi. So let's extract the momentum. So momentum is n times 2p over l minus 2l over delta, which let me circle because it's a loser equation for, for this simple one-dimensional case. So uh, you see that the momentum depends on the phase shift and the volume. And of course, energy this is the momentum outside the region of potential. So this is this momentum. And the energy is in non-relativistic limit, nothing by this, but this. So you can see that the eigen energy is related to the phase shift. OK, is there some questions here? No? OK. So, um, so to, to wrap up. If you extract an eigen energy, this will tell you the uh, phase shift at that energy in this case, and that will tell you the scattering amplitude at this energy. But that's one dimensional quantum mechanics, not that so interesting, but it's easy to derive. Okay, now we go to three dimensional case. Now the problem um, happens basically just because in three-dimensional case, the sphere has different symmetries than the cubic box, but okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, now go to three-dimensional theory and let me first give you the relations and then I'll give you a glimpse of derivation. Okay, I, give, I try to give you a glimpse of QFT derivation. No, okay, here is the relation. You have a system of two hadrons in a box. You do your lattice calculations and you extract the eigen energy via the uh, ways I told you. Now you have your eigen energy and now you can determine the momentum 
of two hadrons in the region outside the potential. In the region outside the potential, um, you know that this relation applies, so you can always determine this momentum. Okay, P will be major importance here. P is the momentum of single particle in the region outside the potential, in some sense. Okay, when you have this momentum, um, the way to get phase shift at this momentum is to plug it into this formula, where z is this Lucer zeta function. It's some function. You plug in the momentum that you got, and you can extract the phase shift at that momentum. Of course, here I'm just giving you the results. I, I have to give you a glimpse of derivation. But just I wanted to give you a result before I give, uh, uh, get you to a little bit painful derivation. OK? A little bit more general result that we'll derive first is the, the following. Again, you have your eigenenergy, and you extract the momentum from it. And um, the key point is this condition here. The fact is that at, at the eigenenergy, this relation should apply. Uh, so only at the eigenenergies, only at the position of lattice eigenenergies, this kind of relation should apply. Now, what is this? M is basically your scattering amplitude at this energy. T is the scattering amplitude that we looked into before. Now I use slightly different normalization M with slightly different normalization just because this is in most of the literature for this purpose, it's like this. So both of us is scattering amplitude at this energy. What is this G? This is a well uh, known kinematical function, which will derive, but it's known whatever energy you have, you get, you can evaluate this kinematical function. So if you extract your eigenenergy and suppose this was a one dimensional determinant equation, then from this eigenenergy, you can directly extract the scattering amplitude at this energy. Ah, what does the determinant run on? It runs in indices of partial waves. And if you only have one partial wave, this is not a determinant, but just one by one equation, okay? So this is the result, of course. Um, I think, uh, let me try uh, to give you a glimpse how it comes about. I should tell you that there is no simple paper that for, me, for my purpose, for derivation. And well, Lucier's original paper is very long and it's not really in the QFT language. It's more in quantum mechanics language and then shows you the way to QFT. But of course, it's original paper, very important work. Um, here I'll be following this reference which is really useful reference for this, but it's not simple. Um, but uh, the derivation, which the, the, I'll mostly follow actually the derivation of my PhD student, Ushers Skerbish, who does the, the, who presents this derivation in her PhD thesis and it is attached to, uh, to your school as an extra material. Know that she has not uh, yet defended the thesis, so there may be some typos, but she shows all the necessary examples, so this might help you. I'll give you the main steps only. Okay. So, what we want to study is correlation functions in a center of momentum frame from the lattice. And those correlation functions, of course, give you your eigenenergies. Uh, to be honest, like this Kim reference, Kim Sakurai, the sharp reference, will actually do the derivation in Minkowski space. And the, the, the comments in this reference is that the, these objects may be obtained from Euclidean lattice correlators by 
analytic continuation to imaginary Euclidean energy. Okay, so derivation will be done in Minkowski finite lattice. And that's how it's done in this very well known reference. Okay, so what is the correlation function as a function of energy when you, in the finite volume? It can be visualized as the following sum. Okay, G is a product of two fully dressed propagators. And here, this box indicates you make a finite sum over the finite momenta on the lattice, which is multiples to pi over L. Um, K, this K is a sum of all amputated two particle irreducible scattering diagrams in S channel. This gives you interaction between your hadrons. Okay. So correlator on the lattice is somehow this sum. Now, now I claim that this correlator that you compute has a pole at the eigenenergies of the system. I'm claiming this, which is very easy to see. Let's see. So the correlator, if we are working in Minkowski space time, will be like this. It will be sum over all discrete eigenenergies with this factor. Now you do a Fourier transform of this correlator from time to energy. So you take this correlator and you do a Fourier transform. Let's see what one gets. You plug this correlator in here and I did it here. And you can see that this will give you a delta function. So this correlator in terms of energy will just be uh, zero everywhere else except at the eigenenergies. So the correlator we are talking about, which is the main object of this study, is has poles at the energies which are equal to the eigenenergies. This will not surprise you. Now, I want to tell you, uh, uh, first I'd like to give you a glimpse why these eigenenergies are related to the scattering matrix, because this is the essence of Lucio relation. Okay, we've seen that the correlator is related to eigenenergies. On the other hand, correlator depends on, if we go to the previous slide, this correlator depends on this blob scale here, right? And, and these blobs k, if you sum them infinitely like this, give you nothing but the scattering amplitude. Okay, so in this sense, the correlator is related to eigenenergies. On the other hand, k is related to the scattering matrix. So in the end of the day, eigenenergies and the scattering matrix will be related. Now let's see how. Is there some question now? I hope people are still following. Okay. I mean, okay, as I said, I tried to give you a glimpse of this derivation. Now, this, this G, which is a, um, a product of two fully dressed propagators, is uh, the main object that makes it different in the finite or infinite volume, okay? So this is the main difference between finite and infinite volume, so we have to study it carefully. So what is this G? Well, it's a product of two propagators. This is one propagator. This is the other propagator. One propagator, fully dressed propagator is well, in QFT, it's like this, where I have separated the usual propagator and the renormalization, the filter renormalization factor. Okay. And you put two such propagators together uh, and you make the finite sum over K, which are just this case here and you integrate over the k0 and your, yeah. Okay, 
Okay, this slide, um, I didn't mean to go um, in detail through, but basically it is just to tell you that the scare, uh, that uh, for those who worry about these um, Z factors, which are field renormalization factors, this slide is just to show you that the scattering amplitude you'll get in the end will be expressed in terms of the bare scattering amplitude in this way, which is the way it should be, because it's a two to two scattering. But I, for those who worry about this, I propose to, to go through this slide uh, on their own. Okay. Now, what is our main aim? Our main aim is to look at the correlator as a function of energy and try to find where are the poles at which eigenenergies and how are they related to the scattering amplitude. That's Lucia relation. Okay, so in finite volume, let's see, in finite volume, um, correlation function will have finite sum over k and it will contain discrete poles at real energies. On the lattice, we always have real energies. Never we go away from real energies, okay? Real energies. And these are the poles we are seeking. These will be the eigenenergies. In infinite volume, of course, uh, there is a integral over momentum and all eigenenergies above threshold are possible because all momenta are possible. So you'll have a continuous energy spectrum or a cut, it's called a cut. And this is not what we are looking for. What we are looking for are these eigenenergies. So, so, so in the remainder, we'll mostly look at this difference. It's correlation function in finite volume minus correlation function in infinite volume we'll call it like this. This object will contain poles we are seeking, so the eigenenergies. Now we want to determine these eigenenergies. Okay, I think we are two slides away from one form of Lucia equation, I guess. Okay, so again, the correlation function is, this, is um, on the lattice in finite volume is, is represented by this, where this is a finite sum. Okay, now, you, now the idea is to make a finite sum as a sum of uh, integral, continuous integral, and finite volume correction. Whatever remains, you say it's my finite volume correction. So you do, in, in place of this box, you always put a sum of this and this, okay? So what you'll get, you'll, I'll, I'll not do this explicitly, you'll, it re requires drawing a little bit, but it turns what you'll get. After you insert this plus this into every one of those here, what you'll get is you'll get the one without any, that you'll get the infinite volume thing, plus the correction. And this correction, the finite volume correction, you, you, you can see it is, this is important, is, can be represented by this sum. So what is this sum? Okay, let us look. So we can see that here only these one lines appear. So this is the finite volume correction, okay? And then we have something a and A prime, the definitions of them is written here, but those are not so important because they are related to operators. Lower, those are not so important. The main thing is that this M, which appears here, now is this infinite volume correct, uh, sum, which contains this K. So this M, which now appears here, is nothing but the scattering amplitude we're after. Okay, 
So now we're almost there. You can see that finite volume correlator is expressed in terms of this finite volume two loop functions and these scattering amplitudes. So we will find relation between them, okay? So we, now we are on the slide where the first form of the Lucia equation appears. The finite volume correction, I'm just rewriting the previous expression, is this. Okay. Now let's see what it is. So let's see, it's A, G, A. The next term is A, G, A, G, M, G, A. Okay, that's this guy and so on and so forth. You can rewrite this as a, this kind of a sum, infinite series. And you can see that this is just a geometric sum, which you can sum and you'll get this expression. So you can see this uh, finite volume correlation function will be some unimportant factors which depend on the operators, but then there will be this factor, which depends on this G and M. Okay, now it's easy to say where this will have pole, right? We are looking for poles. Poles give us the eigenenergies. Pole of this, let's see. This is nothing, uh, is proportional to one over the determinant of this. So, this quantity correlator will have a pole where the determinant of this quantity is equal to zero. So, correlator will have eigenenergy when this determinant is equal to zero. So, this equation basically applies only at the values of the eigenenergies. And let me point again, what does it relate? It relates M, which is the scattering amplitude we are after at this energy. And it contains also this G, which is a finite volume correction to the loop function, which will have to work a little bit more to really to really, to really tell what it is, right? Um, but we know that this G, this is this object here, is finite volume correction to this product of two op propagators. It's nothing so difficult. Okay, it will be some kinematical function. Um, yeah, let me here mention that both are kind of matrices in partial waves. But this one is diagonal in partial waves. If we have a scattering of particles without spin, um, maybe I can tell you why. Um, if, if, there is, if, um, if you have a scattering of particles without spin, total angular momentum will be just equal to the orbital momentum. And that's a partial wave. And since orbital momentum is conserved, also partial wave is conserved for spinless scattering. So this scattering matrix is infinite volume scattering matrix and it will be diagonal. Okay, unfortunately this G turns out that it also has some non-diagonal elements. This is because the symmetry of the infinite volume it's not the same as the symmetry of the finite volume box. But this quantization condition will basically give you information on the scattering amplitude. Now we are almost on, on one, one and a half hours. So yeah, this is, uh, I think before, yeah. Okay, first of all, is there questions? Um, yeah, maybe I have one. So, like, uh, trying to compare this case to the more to the simpler one that we that you showed us before. Basically, the equip so here are the parts that will uh, be related to the to the momentum, for example. 
uh, that, we, uh, that we can extract in, in here in, in finite volume will be contained inside, inside this finite volume correction, basically, this G function. Am I right? Uh huh. <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah. Yeah, there, I never made this direct comparison between one dimensional and three dimensional. So, so, so your question is whether this G will contain this because I mean the, the main point, if I understood correctly, is that we want to relate this uh, uh, this quantity related to the um, to the scattering amplitude, so the phase shift and everything that uh, and this this will be contained inside this uh, sc this m scattering amplitude yeah right so and 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 from the other side we want to link this to this uh, to this momentum uh, to the momentum yeah. that we are able to and so this second part yeah i, guess, I mean you see um i mean there is uh, the relation between energy and the momentum we are always talking about is always like in the non-relativistic limit you can always imagine it like it is the energy relation with the momentum outside the region of potential yeah okay? and then in the non-relativistic limit the relation is e energy yeah, yeah, is e squared yeah, over yeah. 2m yeah, yeah, yeah. and here the relation is this one between this yeah, yeah. energy and the corresponding momentum of two particles you can imagine outside the region of potential. One could call this an on-shell momentum yeah, given yeah. this energy somehow, okay? Sure. I don't know how, to be, to be honest, I'm, I never really tried to convert this going to one dimension and just getting uh, this guy. Yeah, yeah, no, no, of course. I don't no, see uh, it's so I mean, yeah, trivial. It, it, it's not. It's not that easy then to do, to yeah. instantly derive it. Yeah, yeah, from from that. I guess it. Okay. Yeah. So I mean, but but here we see that the momentum outside the region of momentum uh, the the moments are uh, momentum outside the region of potential has to be uh, shifted due to the interaction. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then it has to be like this. And then from this momentum, you directly compute the energy. The energy, sure. But if there is no phase shift, you see, you'll get n is 2 pi over L again. Sure. Okay. Now here, um, if there is no interaction, turns out that cotangent delta, delta will be equal to zero phase shift is zero, cotangent delta is equal to infinity. And again, of course, you get the only momenta that are possible are again. Uh, the, the ones where there is a equality sign here. Yes. Somehow. Okay. I, which it's not so obvious from here, but I know <laughs> from experience. Okay. But otherwise there is, I never found a nice way to go from this equation to this one. It would be good to think about. Okay. 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 Thanks. Um, yeah, I, I think I'm not completely at the end yet. And since it's one hour and a half already, I don't want to, you know, um, uh, prolong this will, it will probably take us another five, 10 minutes next time but we need to go slowly to understand, right? I cannot just rush through it. Uh, so yeah, if there is more questions, perhaps it's better to ask now and then I finalize this next time. No questions? Yeah, I hope I didn't lose you, okay? Uh, just let me give you um, what needs to still be done. But the only thing that really needs to be done is to really study this two loop function, uh, this uh, loop function, basically this thing, and and find 
and find um, well that's what one needs to study okay and then insert this thing to um, basically here and then one can derive the scattering amplitude that's yeah we the only thing we are missing is how this two loop function really looks like but there is few more steps that i really need to go through well but then after we have this relation next time uh basically what i'll go to is uh, using doing using it in uh, specific lattice studies so i'll show several simple lattice results that use this solution relation to really extract the scattering amplitudes for resonances, for bound states, for virtual bound states, for meson systems, for maybe two baryon systems, that you get a feeling. Okay. More questions? Um, no? Yeah, can I ask something? Yes, yeah, uh, sure. So uh, it might have gotten lost a bit, but when, uh, so in the sketch of this proof, I'm not sure I, I clearly understand what this B is. If it's just like a vertex, this blob B, for it starts showing up. K. It was K. No. Ah, B. Which Sorry. then turns into yeah, this yeah, yeah, B. B. Is it like a vertex or not? B is okay. Yeah, I never really uh, told too much about this B. Okay. This is. You know, correlator is you, you create a system with operator. So B is definitely B plus is definitely uh, related to the operator you're using, right? And then B is re uh, you you annihilate the system with an operator. So you it's related to the. So this is all um, related to if I can write to this. No, I can. Let's see if I can. I'm not sure I can. No, I cannot. Let me see. Pointer options. No. So this is basically correlator, right? This is operator where you create a system, it evolves in time t, and you annihilate it with another operator at later time. So, yeah, maybe I didn't explain it. I thought it was. Yeah, yeah, no, okay. Yeah, okay. So, so this is a correlator, right? So this bit. Plus is related to creation operator. This is related to, okay, here you have the same creation and annihilation operator. You could have different if you like, okay? But this is not such an interesting quantity because it really depends on the operator you're using. And since you can use arbitrary operator, uh, it better, the, the, the Lucial relation better doesn't depend on this, right? And you see, in the end, it doesn't depend on these B blobs. They fall out. Okay, so more questions? More questions on this B? You see? Uh, no, no, no. I'm, I'm, I understand now better. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. I should have maybe gone a little bit. Uh, so this B creates two hadrons, which then propagate, right, in finite volume. And the way you, you create them is typically by uh, using, sorry, uh, this is going far, far, sorry, this was not a good idea. You create, you use operator and you create two hadrons via these kind of operators and they propagate, right? Yeah, okay, more questions? No? Yeah, well, if, so if you got lost in this uh, Lucius relation, I could have just given it, right, without any argument, which is very usually done, so. But if you still got lost, don't uh, get scared. Um, I'll repeat what is Lucius relation next time, and then I'll go to applications, and then you don't need to see the proof. Uh, how you derive it, you just know, have to know how to use it. Okay, so don't decouple if you got decoupled now. <laughs>